We're going to start on our two panels this afternoon. But in the meantime, I do want to highlight one of the other events that are going on here at the, the conference. In the lower level of the lobby, which is as you walk into the lobby, there's a sunken area below. Due to the timing of when we're putting on this conference, we thought that it would be a great opportunity for us to share some of the use of technology as in our daily lives we use it. And because of the timing with the election, we thought it would be nice to showcase some new technology that is used for voting, also allow people here in Colorado to register to vote. As, so this collaboration has been a partnership with the Arc of Colorado, the Colorado People First group, um, speaking for ourselves. Also, the National Self-Advocates Becoming Empowered group. We have Representative Nancy Ward here from that group who works on the Vote Project, who has materials. And then Disability Law Colorado is there, who is assisting with the registering to vote. So I want to direct you to that as an opportunity to go see some other types of technology and to see how it can influence what we are doing in every day. Um, so please go see that. So without further ado, I am going to introduce Dr. Tony Antosh, who is a mentor of mine and good friend. Um, and I'll, I'll leave that at that. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Very long history. Um, but he's going to introduce this panel on employment, and we're thrilled to have all of these folks. And you'll see their bios in your program and their images on the screen. So go ahead, Tony. And we have this huge clock that's really sort of intriguing as it's the countdown clock. Depending upon what your, your point of view is, the end of it produces who knows what. Um, <laughs> let me just, before I, hey, before I sort of tell you how this will work, let me introduce uh, briefly, and as Shea said their bios are in your program book, so you can read much greater detail about them. But the three other panelists this morning going from my left to Liz at the end, this is Derek Nord who's the director of the Indiana Institute on um, Disability and Community, which is the Indiana USED. Um, Derek is also the current president of the Association for People Supporting Employment First, APSI, for those of you who, uh, who know APSI but don't know what APSI stands for. Next to Derek is Dennis Boudreau, um, who is the principal web accessibility consultant and um, strategist for a Montreal-based company named DQ. Uh, and he's also a member of the worldwide W3C um, consortium that deals with accessibility, as you all know. To the far left is my good friend, Liz Weintraub, who I've known for about 806 years, although <laughs> Liz really doesn't look that old. Um, Liz is a self-advocacy and policy specialist at AUCD. But what Liz is best known for, um, if you look on the web, if you search for Tuesdays with Liz. Every Tuesday, Liz puts out a, um, um, a what do I call it? A, um, a promotion, a, an interview with a policymaker. And some of them are, are really insignificantly important people, but Liz is wildly popular. Um, around the country. Many of us have little pins that say that has Liz on a pin. I was going to bring mine, but I forgot. So that's who our panelists are. The thing we're going to do this morning is that I get about eight to ten minutes to introduce the, the topic, and then we essentially have three questions that we're going to all sort of talk to in some form. The three questions, very simply, are what has not worked um, in the area of employment? That's question number one. Question number two, why have all these long-term investments that have been made over the last 40 years to advance em em employment for people with disabilities not worked? And then question three, very simply, is how can technology play a role um, in promoting um, greater access to employment for uh, people with disabilities across the employment um, lifespan. So those are the questions we'll talk about. But um, I get to sort of do my introduction first. You know, when I talk about employment, um, which I seem to do a lot these days, because as some of you know, um, R Rhode Island is under a Department of Justice consent decree to essentially make employment happen in, in integrated settings for all people with developmental disabilities in the state. So we have, I think, 600 people who are currently employed, working about 10 hours a week, and uh, another 38, another 2,800 to go. So, uh, and even for the ones who are, the notion of 10 hours per week is really not 
quite where the standard should be. So I, we talk about employment a lot these days. But I find that when I talk about em, 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 employment, my, the memory that comes to my mind is, uh, is 1975, when our state had opened, I think, the second or third community residence. Those were the days when we had filed a court suit to close our institution down, and we were in the process of doing that. And so this home had just opened. There were five people who were living there. Everybody was thrilled that people who were living there. One, one weekend night, we were sitting around the, the, the dining room table, and the question was, so now that people have a place to live, well, what else do they do? You know, and somebody suggested profoundly, we, everybody ought to have a job. Wouldn't that be cool? You know, and so those were the days, for those of you who are old, not that anybody in the room is old, of Tom Bellamy and Paul Wayman, all those were the people who were beginning to introduce the support and employment notion. So, the, so we have been, if you will, promoting support and employment, have been promoting employment in the broadest sense for 40 some years now. And so the question is, since we've been doing this for 40 years, you would think we'd be there by now. That old metaphor, are we there yet? Um, you know, and I guess part of what I'm supposed to tell you is that we're not even close to being there yet. So let me just, as an indicator of current status, let me give you some data. Um, if you look at the Department of Labor stats, essentially what you find is that people who are workforce age, um, 16 to 64, being older than 64, I question that number, um, but 31% but of people with disabilities of all sorts are engaged in the workforce. People without disabilities, it's 77%. So there's a huge gap there. If you apply the same concepts to people with intellectual disabilities, um, it's 14.8%. So again, we have some people working, but the percentage of people who work is really very small. Um, second concept that I would give you is that the idea, and not that I want to fixate on the word, but the word supported employment implies the fact that we support people, a really profound notion there. So um, my center does a survey of every person um, with IDD in, in the state. So last, about three months ago, our most recent statewide survey, 3,308 people, um, what we found out is that of those 3,308 um, people, only 19% of them received any kind of supported employment service. Only 14% of them were engaged in a job search, and the amount of time devoted to that job search was 45 minutes per week. Um, we found that 12% of them were in some sort of a career exploration experience for an average of one hour and 10 minutes a week. Um, only 16% were involved in any kind of effort to promote um, self-determination in an organized way. Only 10% had um, an active open case with VR. That's up from previous years before the consent decree where it was 3%. Um, and as applied to what we're talking about here, we have ATAP funds in the state that are designed to provide um, technology and accommodations that people need. We find in the, of the 3,304 people, I think there were seven um, who had used ATAP funds in some way, shape, or form. So even though we talk about support being a, real, a really critical and a really significant thing, we seem to not have really figured out how to do support in a really truly active, meaningful, integrated way. The other statistic that I would give you very simply is that we all know there's lots of um, evidence out there that the more you are involved, the more that a person is involved in his or her community in some way, shape, or form, um, the more likely that person is to be employed. Because, you know, there, there was a, an early study that Paul Wayman did way back when, where he found that 90-some percent of people without disabilities who were employed got jobs through relatives and friends. Um, we always joke that that's a Rhode Island statistic if we've ever heard one. But that notion of it's the relationships oftentimes that lead to jobs. So based upon the notion of sort of developing and having um, community relationships as a precursor to work, we needed to look at how much community contact people had. And so in one other little survey that we did where we had 600 people who lived in um, community residences of some fort, we, we kept a two-week log of minute by minute for two weeks, including sleeping time, um, how they spent um, their time. And what we found is that, and we looked at who they spent and what they did and all that stuff, we found that 99% of their time was spent with people that they lived with or people who were paid to be with them. And less than 1% of their time was spent with any other community members. So if you don't spend 
a whole lot of time with other community members, it once again does not surprise me um, that our rights of employment, our rights of participation um, in the world of employment are really so small. So based upon just that data and based upon the fact that 40 years ago I would have said by 2016, 99% of people will work. It's only the old people like me who won't work, but you know, what the hell. But, but the fact that that's not happened indicates that we're doing something wrong. So my challenge and my, the, the questions and what we're gonna talk about is I guess the need to redefine what employment means. I mean, let me just throw out one other number. When you take all those 3,400 people that I referred to before, and you look at the amount of time that is devoted and committed to being employed right at this point, it's a half of 1%. So that means that 99.5% of the total state time um, is being committed to something else, and what that something else is is oftentimes not meaningful, not productive. So one of the things that we want to promote in a really vivid way is the notion of that employment is a good goal. Employment is a significant goal, but employment is part of life, it's not all of life, and employment is really a means to an end um, rather than being an end in and of itself. We think that's a really significant thing. So what we really want to do is sort of see if we can help you think about and redefine all aspects of employment, and that includes stuff like what does work really mean? What does the rest of life really mean? Well, how do you really develop interests in work? Um, how do you really prepare for work? What does support mean? Because we don't seem to do support very well. And, and uh, the, the other profound question, where does funding come from? Because um, I think we get stuck in believing that one funding source is really the answer to everything. So the question that we raised is that 40 years ago we thought we'd be there. 40 years later we've discovered we're not there. Um, and so the question is we obviously have to do something different to be able to get closer to that goal in some form. So having said that, having given that intro and that challenge, let me move to the questions. Question one is so what has not worked um, in the area of employment? And Derek will start. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great that this conference is focusing on uh, employment, at least in part. I think it's phenomenal intersection. A couple caveats before I jump into this, because I can here for days on this topic. Um, one, I had a baby a week ago, so I came to Colorado to get some sleep. <laughs> Yay! So, uh, I may ramble. I'll use that as my excuse today. Um, secondly, um, well, secondly, I, I, you know, our, our, the, our keynote earlier this morning said a really important thing, and I, I just want to emphasize it, and that was um, we have come a long, long ways, and we should be in the position, and, and this is summarizing, we should be in the position to be critical, though, of where we are. We have a long ways to go. So I just want to emphasize that I, I recognize how far we've come. So my words are, are oftentimes critical on this topic because I realize there's actually, we have so much further to go. Um, but I want to acknowledge that we have come a long way, and I know it's in great deal, great part because of many in this room and well beyond this room. So that being said, I, this, this was a tough question what, you know, for me because it really required me, particularly because of the time constraint, to hone in on, on what I think right now is one of the biggest challenges that we face. And when I think about employment, I think about how far we've come in this world of employment. Today we know um, these long-held beliefs that people with disabilities, cognitive disabilities, intellectual, developmental, other cognitive disabilities, we know today, unlike we, we thought we knew um, a while back, that they do want to work, they can work, we have best practices that allow them access to employment. So we know, we actually know that it, it works. Employment, individual employment in the competitive workplace actually works. We know that. We have best practices, we have evidence base that's continues to grow and continues to emerge and develop and, and progress and evolve. Yet today, most people continue to lack access to some of these critical supports to make that happen. So when I, when I think of, about this topic, what are some, why haven't we gotten there, my big theme is really around access and access to those best practices in particular. So think about your state, think about where you're from, and, and think about your role within our, our formal services that we, that we deliver in, this, in the ser disability service system. And then th think about how limited 
just this idea of an individual employment services and supports continue to be today in 2016 for people with, with cognitive disabilities. To me, that's it's astounding, and we should be, we should be afraid. I, I am a recent transplant from Minnesota to Indiana, and I, I see the same kind of challenges there, where we have this great idea, we know what the best practices are, yet getting those integrated within our service delivery system continues to hit roadblocks. So that's one. Secondly, when we, we tend to often, we oftentimes operate with the assumption that most people, or that every person with an intellectual, developmental, or other cognitive disability is involved in these formal services and supports. That's an operating assumption that I think we have to, to kick back, push back on. There's actually a great many people that don't even intersect in these systems that we tend to operate in. So when I think about access and access to these best practices, I think about not just within that formal service systems, but what about those that aren't touching those systems? What kind of access do they have to some of to these emerging ideas and these best practices to find keep jobs? So when I think about um, where we need to go, I, I really, I, much of my work is really around access and how we can expand access to people within these formal services that many of us operate in, but then well outside of that. And how do we help people, families, um, support or caregivers, um, allies of people who aren't in those systems, how do we get them, uh, give them the power to actually make uh, employment a reality for them themselves as well. So I'll pass it to my colleague. Thank you. <laughs> um, so sort of similar to what Derek just said, um, I come from the world of web accessibility. So my job basically is making websites more accessible to people that have disabilities. That's the foundation of what I do. Uh, as an extension of that, we also try to make things more accessible or easier to use for people that are getting older, people that are using the web on different devices and stuff like that. So it's the idea of expanding the reach of the web to as many people as possible. And, and the, the area of employment is a in really interesting one because you would have thought that when, when the web came to be, and that we had all these technologies that allowed us to find jobs easy or more easily, that it would have been a great way to improve access to jobs for people that had disabilities. And it turns out that it really hasn't. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you've paid attention to those things uh, in the past 14 years or so, uh, based on the statistics, statistics that I found from the US Bureau of Labor, something, something, um, we, had, uh, we had like 24.4% 20, of, of people with disabilities at a job in 2000. That number dwindled, dwindled down to 12.9 12 in 2014. So it steadily went down year after year. And interestingly enough, so to speak, uh, the use of, of, of online recruiting platforms has gone up uh, at the same time. So the more, what the trend that we see is the less we have jobs available in newspapers or services that are like in physical places, and the more jobs we have available online only, the more difficult it becomes for people with disabilities to find jobs. There's a, there's a really clear correlation to establish there. And, and that's basically where, where the, the kind of place where I work is, is trying to figure out how we can help organizations that, that provide these platforms or developers that create those platforms for, for, for organizations, how they can make these things more accessible so that more people can, can have access to them. And I think a lot of the problem comes from lack of awareness in that sense. Um, I remember this one, this one uh, uh, moment, uh, maybe like three or four years ago, where I was providing training to a group of developers that worked on a very popular um, online recruiting site that you guys all know about, I'm sure which I won't name. Um, but uh, but we, we were in the discussion where we were talking about like simple best practices to make content more accessible to people who say have dyslexia or people that are on the autistic spectrum at one point or another. People that just use the web in a different way or think about things in a different way or maybe spend need a little more time to go through different tasks that others will take for granted, for instance. And, and even after having spoken for like an hour and a half on those those differences and what we need to think about, in order to be more inclusive in the way that we design these things, I still had one developer who rose his, uh, rose his hand and asked me, well, doesn't it come down to being lazy, really? Because all of that stuff is available, it's out there, all you need to do is read that stuff, you click on the button, you upload your CV, and that's it. And I mean, even after an hour and a half of, of talking to them about the, the importance of like just thinking more inclusively and being, being aware of the differences between how we use the web, 
it just wasn't getting through to, the, to these guys. And it's not because they were bad intentioned or anything like that, it's just that it's so far away from their reality that they don't really think about that and it's very difficult to do that. So I think, go back, going back to your question, what hasn't worked so far in, in, the, uh, in employment to, to make sure that people with disabilities are more involved or have a better access is largely in part a lack of awareness. Uh, we, still, we still don't do enough in that field. We rely on technology way too much. We expect technology to help us fill in those gaps uh, almost automatically, and it just doesn't happen that way. Um, so, so that would be my answer to your question at this point. Uh, the fact that we can see that, that the percentage of, of people finding jobs has pretty much melted by half in the past 14 years, while technologies, technology should have allowed us to multiply that by maybe 10, uh, is a really great indication that there's a big problem there. Liz? Liz. Um, there are two, th thank you, and I wanted to thank the Coleman Institute for um, believing in people with disabilities, and that's what I want to, to begin with. Um, I think that um, it's really important to believe in people with disabilities. Um, I notice on this, um, when you're looking uh, on who's on this panel, there's um, two, of, two people who have letters behind their names. And um, I don't know, but then there's, but um, I don't have letters behind my name. And I think that's a barrier to jobs. I think that people don't believe in me because I don't have letters behind my name. And in some ways I do because I have TWL Tuesdays with Liz. I'm the host of that show. But, but when people, when I, I want a job or a career in the field and people I say TWL, nobody knows what TWL means. You might know it because you're in this field, but, but the average Joe in who, who I'm going up to Microsoft or I'm going to a, 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 um, want a job from, Nobody knows what TWL is. And I think that's not my fault that I, I don't have letters behind my names. I don't have letters behind my name because I don't have the education to. And I get that I need to earn those letters, but I don't have the education. And most people with disability don't have the education to earn the right to have those letters behind their name. And I don't mean to say that it's easy to get those letters because I imagine you guys have worked really hard for the letters. But as I said, it's not my fault that I don't have the letters behind my name. And if people believe, just took the time to believe in what I could do, then, then I think that people can get jobs. And it's about relationships. Most of my job I didn't get from a newspaper or applied for a job. I got them because people believe in me. People know who Liz Weintraub was or is. So therefore, people believe in what I could do. The letters doesn't matter. Can I? Janice, go ahead. Something. So um, to your point, um, I, I'm very much involved in education as well. Uh, same idea, working with universities and colleges to help teachers bring 
content that is available to students with disabilities. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of what that means, but we've heard about PDF this morning, for instance, and you probably already know the, the issues that you guys have or, or the struggles that you have working with PDF documents and how they're difficult to, to handle in different cases and stuff like that. So that's, that's kind of what I do. And, and in, in the education, uh, or whatever we call that. Um, basically, um, people, students with disabilities, about half of them never go through the first, the, the, they never get their first diploma. They just can't get to that. So you're, you're saying something about not, maybe not having the opportunity to have the right people around you to support you and give you like, what you needed to go there, but there, there are more obstacles than that. If, if someone, so if someone has, is lucky enough or has, is, is fortunate enough, that they have the proper support and they end up enrolling into a program, then they get into a university that is completely not adapted to their needs. So finding a job, going back to that idea, finding a job is complicated because the technology doesn't help you much, but then getting to a point where you would have the degree, the letters that you're talking about, having that degree that allows you to maybe differentiate yourself from other people that would also want that job, you are likely not to be able to do that because the content that is provided to you in, in those curriculum isn't adapted to your reality and your need. So again, I'm, I don't want to be criticized, I don't want to criticize when, anyone when I say that we don't have enough awareness or, or we're not raising enough awareness about these things, but most of the, the issues that we have today, you're talking about 40 years of, of trying to do this. 40 years ago, there wasn't as much uh, thought put into, so what, how am I supposed to adapt my course for someone who, uh, who's, who, who, who's autistic, for instance. There isn't much thought given to that still today. I, can, I know for a fact. I, I talked I talk with people in, in different, uh, different um, I don't know what the word is in English, but um, I, I talked to a bunch of people that are involved in, in, the, in higher ed, and their eyes always go really big when you say, well, you, you, you realize that you have people in your classes that are deaf, that are blind, that, that are dyslexic, that, uh, that, are, that have a, a bunch of different uh, disabilities or, or, or challenges that make it more complicated for them. And they're like, well, yeah, sort of, but they, they usually come in with someone or, or we give them uh, more time. But you're like, yeah, but if you give them more time and that person is blind and you're giving them PDFs and those PDFs don't have anything in them that's text, it's just images, and you don't describe those images, you could give them five years for all we care, they never would still be able to do it. So people don't realize don't, at, at what point, at the extent to which they become the problem unknowingly, uh, creating those barriers. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel, I feel your, your resentment towards what you just said, and I'm very empathetic to it, but the reality is also that the system makes it complicated for you. Yes. Very much so. So we've already begun to talk about question two. Question one was about what hasn't worked. Question two is about why. And I'm going to go back to Liz just for any other comments about why it has not worked. I think that the, the issue is people don't believe in people with disabilities. I think that um, people don't think that we can do this. I can tell you in quick a uh, story when I, and I'm very, very lucky, I know this, when um, my parents sat down with me and when I was 18, 19, and said what I w would like to do. And I said I wanted to be a policy analyst. Well, they laughed at my, and my parents are, are, were one of the most, most wonderful parents. I, I'm very, very lucky. I know that. But my parents laughed in my face. They truly laughed in my face. Maybe I'm being exaggerating. But, um, but I think that they laughed in my face because they didn't think that I could work on the hill. They didn't think that I could go to meetings like this and to talk to president. Talk, I don't mean presidents. I talk to senators and congresspeople and 
and try to advocate on myself. And as you, you heard, Tony, I, I interview people all the time. You can look on Tuesdays with Liz. But, and I, I think the, the point of the story is that people need to believe in people with disability. And if it wasn't for my boss, I don't think I would be where I am today. So, you, you know, if you think about what Liz said and you think about what we've all said, we talk about how important supports are, but how we don't provide them to everybody. And we certainly don't provide them to many people in a meaningful way. We've talked about access. Access becomes a really significant thing. But you talk about expectations as well. There's lots of evidence out there that says if the people who support you believe you can work, you're something like five times more likely to work than if the people who support you do not believe you can work. You can play that across school. You can play that across transition years. You can play that all the way up to 68. It, that notion of expectation becomes a significant thing. So Dennis or Derek? I, I think I'll jump in if you don't mind. I, I, I appreciate you mentioning expectations. And I think that's an important thing for us to realize. Um, Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and take the different roles that that we have in this room. Those expectations um, are critical at every role. Um, both the expectations that a person has of themselves, um, their family members, and their loved ones and allies closest to them. Um, I think, if I had to guess, most of us in here are somehow connected to the to the service systems. You know, through through state, local governments, maybe uh, provider of services. I, I think I think we, and I consider myself in that group as well. I think we need to to take stock of what our expectations are, and we need to really realize that sometimes we can be the biggest barrier uh, because of the low expectations we have. Um, I think you can also see how those expectations play out in in the policy arena when you think about where our investments have been historically and continue to be. I think we're in this kind of point of, of evolution and shifting, I think, in the federal and state policy environment or funding environment that's going to put a little more emphasis on or more emphasis on individual employment services and supports. That's critical. But that's, been a, that's taken 40 years to get this conversation going and actually moving in the policy arena. To this day, I will say, and we, we haven't gotten there yet, and most of our funding for, uh, for services goes to residential services, non-employment day services, or segregated environments. And that's the reality. And let's face it, you, pay, you get what you pay for. So um, we, I think the advocacy is going to be critical to continue that push forward. Um, because for people in those systems that, that we continue to hear want work, um, they uh, just don't have ac maybe access to certain services and supports, or they don't have adequate support to to work competitively in, in uh, at the level that they want to. These are the ch big changes that need to happen, and and it requires us to to reflect on on this long val. We have a, lo a strong value base, particularly in this field of intellectual developmental cognitive disabilities, and we are fortunate to have a very strong value base. But I will say, in this in this place of employment. We continue to come up pretty dang short. Um, we continue to, to hear the, uh, the outcomes that people want and the services that they receive is the opposite. They're, they are counter. And I think at some point we have to realize that we as service uh, actors are, are getting in the way and we need to be pushing and advocating a lot harder. So um, I'll stop there. I can go down that path really deep. So. <laughs> so um... I'll, I'll, I'll look at it from the techno technological approach because that's that's all I know really. Um, so, um, so so what what I can tell is that there hasn't been real investment in that sense, like, like for inclusion in that sense. We spend a lot of energy, resources, and time making websites that are always more interesting or or or, or, or fun to use or sexy or whatever adjective you want to put next to, to website, website to attract people and, and having them want to use ours instead of our competitors. But we don't spend a lot of time and energy thinking about what a lot of people would call edge cases. And, and I, I kind of hate the, the word edge cases in a way, because and you, you probably are like me, but the, I, the, the simple idea of saying that we won't really think or, or bother with people that have disabilities because that's not our, our target audience, for instance, 
a lot of people find a lot of, of good reasoning in that, but at the same time, every time you decide that someone who has a cognitive disability, for instance, is a hedge case and you can't really afford to pay attention to that, you're also pretty much drawing the line of the people that you actually care about. And you're making a pretty strong statement that these people don't actually count. And, and that's, that's pretty bad. And people don't realize this, but they do that all the time. So, in, in, and some of the things that I, that I work on changing, and, and you guys may be doing that too, is again, advocating, uh, helping people understand the benefits of including people with disabilities in what they build, for instance, uh, on very simple things like the fact that if you pay attention to, like I was, I was discussing with Liz just before we started, and she was saying that one of, one of the issues that she has when she's navigating on a website is finding out what, what she's supposed to be clicking on. That button, that link, it's all of these things, it's, it's a lot of stuff to, to, to deal with. And if people paid attention, if developers in, in organizations that have websites for employment, for instance, if they just paid attention to that for a minute, and instead of having internal testing with a designer and a developer that are in their 20s or, or really tech savvy, and just get it automatically, and they went out of their way a little bit and tested with people that have disabilities instead, they would uncover so many different things that don't work, that would make the process easier, and would help, would help people with disabilities actually find jobs, or at least get a foot in the door to maybe have a chance to get that job. Right now, they don't even have access to them uh, because, of, because of that problem. So the investments, in that sense, the investment, I feel, are are uh, sort of backwards in a way when it comes to, to the, the social aspect of things. Uh, very much focused on technology, but very little focused on, on humans. And, and that's really where we should be, be spending our, our energy as much as possible. So if you, what I would ask maybe of you is if you're in a position where you deal with vendors or you negotiate with them or stuff like that, if you, uh, well, e either you, you, kind of, you, you get in touch with me, because I think our, our, our contact infos are, are in the, the programs and stuff, but I'm, I'm going to be delivering sometime this afternoon a, uh, a PDF version of a presentation I did earlier, uh, not here, but I mean at a different conference, about this particular topic and things that you could do or ask your vendors for, to, for more accessible content online. And maybe if you start having discussions with your vendors, you can maybe change things on your, at your level as well. Uh, it's not only something that technologists need to do, but it's something that we all need to be doing, try and advocate for, for better inclusion and, and, and more, more, well, yeah, inclusion, more inclusion. You know, before we go on to question three, I just want, I feel the need to say the word, that one of the things we need to redefine is what person-centered thinking really means, that when you look at person-centered thinking now, it tends to be agency-driven, um, tends to happen in not the person's place, you know, so you hear when you read this stuff, you hear about um, job development out of the person's driveway. That's one of those concepts that I really like, where it moves from a process really driven by somebody other than the person to we need to re-operationalize that to a process that looks at the person's life, looks at the experiences they need, looks at what they want, but sometimes what you want is determined by what you have experienced. So if you haven't enough experiences yet, your want list may be very small. So the need to reconceptualize all of those kinds of things. Going on to, qu go ahead. Uh, well, I, I, would, I would add with that, I think <laughs> self, this idea of self-determination too, yeah. it's another one of those big values that we hold dear. I think it's, a, it's one of those values though that uh, when someone, someone is self-determined or, or identifies a direction that they want in their life and that runs counter to what, what we as system actors think is right, um, self-direction quickly becomes tamped down into a, a great idea that maybe you shouldn't do or it's not safe. And I, I say that because uh, we have to realize as the support providers, as the service, again, as the service actors, what our role is. Is our role to facilitate that outcome or is it to be the reason why they get that outcome? And I, I, I do think our role is facilitator, meaning it puts me on the side. It doesn't mean it's not critical. It puts me on the side. It puts me as a partner, not as the director. And I think we have to realize that because I think technology, and I think going into our next question, I think it's the, it's the equalizer for us, or for people with disabilities. It puts them, potentially, it has the potential to put them much more in the driver's seat um, so they can guide the direction that they want. Again, we have to recognize, though, we can be the problem. Uh, when we say self-determination is what we want, yet when self-determination is what's desired, we it's when we get in the way, then we get in the way of employment. That happens all the time, every day throughout the entire country, So, and well outside of this country. So I'll, I'll leave it at that so we can jump into the next. Question three, so what role can technology play in resolving all of this? Dennis, you're first. 
Well, I'll just, I'll just continue on what I was saying earlier. Um, just, just think about people, with, say, with dyslexia. Uh, considered technically to be a disability, not really recognized in society as being a real problem. Um, people manage to make their way around, around the, the challenges all the time. You have a lot of people that have diplomas that struggle through their, their entire, uh, um, I don't know what, again, I don't know what the word is in English, but through, through their entire curriculum, uh, they struggled with being able to go through all the, the exercises and, and exams they had to do, but they somehow managed to do it. Um, but what, what, when you think about technology and how it could help people with dyslexia, for instance, it comes down to design most of the time. It's not really a technology itself, it's really just how you design the interfaces that you're going to be using. People with dyslexia have a really hard time struggling with walls of text, but guess what, we all do. I mean, it's not, it's not, a re it's not really a, a surprise to anyone. If I have to read a job description, and instead of having thought about neatly displaying the entire thing with bullet points so I can read all the requirements, if you put the entire thing into a 10 or 15 pa line paragraph, and it's a really small font with no, no, like no breathing space, I'm not gonna, I, I won't wanna read it either. It's a very simple thing. It's not about technology in that case, it's just about how you, how you approach the, the way that you present your information. So th there are a lot of, of, of situations like that, or, or, or just think about headings, for instance, in your document. Again, you have your job description and, and the, expected, uh, the expectations for, for, for that position and all that stuff. If you don't pay attention to maybe breaking it down into smaller paragraphs with really uh, meaningful headings to understand what those, what those topics are, again, someone with dyslexia is going to be completely uh, put off by it. But I would too, and I don't have dyslexia. Uh, but this is something that would help me as well. So, so, so when you look at te 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 technology, I, I think technology is already doing its job. Uh, that might be a bold statement, maybe I'll regret that. <laughs> technology might already be doing its job when it comes to democrat democratizing access to it, but how we use that technology is the actual problem today. And, and again, going back to what I was saying earlier, and I'll wrap up with that because time is running out, but if, we, if, we are, if we're aware, if we're of the role that we can play and the responsibility that we have as people that are designing the, these platforms and, and allowing people to have access to, to jobs, we will design it differently. If we involve people with disabilities into the process to have their input and fix things according to what their expectations would be, using like, like using iconography, for instance, to make it easier to identify different parts of the page. That's very simple. We've known about that stuff for years. Somehow we don't think about it when it comes to helping people. So if we did that, the technology is already there to give us a lot of access to different things, but if we used it in a more, I guess, a more a sensitive way or a more, uh, a more empowering way, then uh, then we could fix part of that problem. Derek, yeah, I mean, I think I think about how I've used technology just today in, related to my work, and let's let's think. I have an iPhone. I'm sure everyone, everyone here does, um, or most people. It just let's use this idea of internet access. Um, people with cognitive disability, access to the internet, it, though still far behind the general population, it is, it is far closer than it, it used to be even five years ago. Uh, people with mental health issues, it's actually on par with the general population. So, and that's just internet access. So imagine that on a mobile device. Um, this idea that I can wake up, have my tasks laid out for me, organized, I can get to work and navigate to my workplace either uh, using, um, uh, say, Google Maps or any other app, uh, and that might give me directions both walk or walking, driving, or, or public transportation, and it will give me live time directions to when you get to work, maybe get supports. I FaceTimed with my wife today, um, had a conversation with my daughter, Face to face. I mean, these are these are applicate. There are applications just on an iPhone, right out of the box, that can be used immediately and integrated within the 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 the, the uh, day to day su support for people with disabilities on the job. Both getting to work, the lead up to to work. Um, on the job, uh, find a job to network with the people that you know, both through social media, but also through text messaging. And I guess my, my question to all of you is, how are you integrating that into your, into your supports? Let's not take, take, let's not assume people know that it's intuitive how to use these and integrate these into one's daily life. 
It's our job to help support people so they can learn how to integrate this. And then for us to use this as a tool, say, to um, call on a regular basis or FaceTime and have some live FaceTime uh, job coaching support that doesn't require, say, a drive 50 miles out to provide that service. We can provide it immediately face-to-face -face, while addressing a real-time concern. So I guess it's, it's our job to really figure out how we integrate that, but let, we cannot. What we cannot do is assume that people will know how to do it. We have to, assume, we have to operate with, I think, and I, disability or not, we should be operating with that people might need support and training on how to integrate this within their daily support network. And, and it's even just out of the box, just the apps that I'm mentioning, these, these can be used today. Um, and then there's a number of others, there's hundreds of other ones that can be woven in to educate, to um, systematic instruction. I mean, there's a number of other apps. So I think we've, it's our job, it's our responsibility to start integrating these ideas into our daily support and supporting people to use it. So I'll hand it off to Liz. Just um, I think technology has helped people with disability by allowing them to stay home if they need to. Um, for example, uh, yesterday we had this staff meeting and we, people, um, people had virtual communication through uh, technology. Um, and I think that's important because not everyone can or would like to be part of um, a work environment. Um, some people can't go to work for lots of various reasons or, or they're just having a bad day. I remember somebody telling me that because of um, the, the shooting that happened um, um, in Florida with the uh, les gay and lesbian community, uh, somebody just could not get out of bed. So therefore, he could work from home if he needed to and wouldn't be docked from pay because he just could not get out of bed. So we'll end because the doomsday clock has ended. And we are all still here, which I guess is a good thing. So I'll just end with the words that we talked about access, we talked about expectations, we talked about employment, but emphasized that employment is just a part of life and we need to do this in a much more comprehensive way. One more quick thought, Liz. Yeah. Well, they're they're going to give us a bad time. Yeah. Real quick. Um, just a quick question. Quick thing. Um, I'm allowed to, to think about what I wanted to do at 15, 16 years old, just like anyone else. But I wasn't allowed to do that. Nobody thought that I could have a, a career. Nobody thought that. Right after high school, that's when people thought about me getting a job. But it needs to begin earlier. Which makes the point about why transition is the most important part of life. Thank you. Thank you. Beautifully done.